So good morning, everybody. If you would uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans uh, chapter 4, we're going to see if we can get through verses 5 through 12. But prior to that, um, I think by necessity, we have to talk about the date, September 11th, 2001. And, you know, I was, uh, I moved the car this morning, put it out in the backyard, and Backyard, my backyard, not your backyard, out there. And uh, in that, I was thinking about a lot of things that God let come upon me during my life. You know, a lot of things that just absolute bring a smile to your face, make your face hurt type of things, and other things that uh, the Lord allowed that dropped me into my knees and uh, just brought. Um, weeping into my life. And this morning, um, as we are going to briefly talk a little bit about uh, September 11th, 2001. September 10th, 2001. Who knew in its entirety, so you got to, in its entirety, who knew in the entirety of what would happen um, on September 11th, uh, what was going to happen? Who, who's the only one who knew that? Terrorists. Oh. Uh, now, certainly those who were plotting, certainly those who um, had um, thoughts of evil that they wanted to bring forward, they knew the generalities of what they were going to do. But God, on September 10th, knew the entirety of the plan as yet it was to be carried out. And you think about that. And if you can't put your mind around the fact that God has a plan, his plan is not our plan, and that plan is far different from any plan we could come up with. And if you can't get your mind around that, then what happens on September 11th, 2001, simply destroys you simply takes and drops you forever to your knees and probably sucks the living daylights out of you. And it doesn't mean that at that moment, perhaps some of those things shouldn't occur. But we know that we know that God has a plan, reading out of uh, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together. The things that we understand, the things that we don't, the things that uh, bring joy into our lives are the things that uh, allow us to grieve. And so on that, on that day, the World Trade Center, 2,823 people entered into eternity. At the Pentagon, uh, 125 people entered into eternity. Flight 11, 92 people. Flight 175, 64 people, flight 77, 64 people, and flight 93, 44 people entering into eternity. And many others through the years who were at uh, the World Trade Center and, and many other places is the different uh, aspects of uh, the, the fire, uh, the, the fumes and whatever else became part of their lives, they entered into eternity as well. And so, for us who remain, it's an incredible opportunity to pray for those who've lost loved ones. It's an incredible opportunity for those of us to not stick our head in the sand and uh, believe that um, we don't have a part to play in, um, in elections, that we don't have a part to play in uh, service to community, uh, it, it would do us well to uh, continue to reflect upon uh, the very the very fact that God has allowed us to stay here, and, and what purpose has He allowed you to stay here for? Right? Why are you here? What are you doing? And in that, um, back to September 11th, 2001, uh, a lot of folks entered into eternal joy. 
and I dare say some folks entered into eternal damnation. Right? Serious stuff you've been entrusted to with. You know, bringing the gospel to those who are perishing. And so as we see a, a video this morning, um, just ask the Lord, why am I here? What, what purpose do you have for me? And am I accomplishing uh, that which is your will for my life? So we have a short video. Lights off. Camera's on. <clears throat> The minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built. Wars were fought. Victims' names were read. Survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He's closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. We will always remember. You know, there are a few folks in the room here with us this morning who um, went to 911, went to uh, New York, and uh, in that um, they went, um, some of us stayed behind uh, to fill in gaps that um, were created as they left. And I know one thing that those who lost loved ones that day um, need our prayers and in that uh, let us pray father we come before you and lord so many on that day lord uh, lost their lives and in that losing of life lord we give you thanks for those who lord you ushered into your presence and lord we pray for the families that uh, lord indeed uh, lost loved ones that day and Lord in the days um, that uh, came after that. Father, even this day, uh, many uh, mourn, many grieve, many remember and uh, as it should be. And so Father, we uh, ask that you would comfort. We ask that you would encourage and Father, we ask for those that at this moment uh, don't know you, uh, that this day, this moment might be a moment, the day of their salvation. Father, we give you thanks that you know, Lord, all things that are going on and that you do have a purpose and a plan. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, if you would uh, open your Bibles. <coughs> uh, we're in Romans uh, chapter 5, or chapter 4, excuse me, verses uh, 5 through 12, and the title is Abraham Believed God. And... Uh, you know, once again, as I as I was out sitting in my car earlier this morning, you know, I thought about where would I be personally if I didn't have faith in God? 
Where would I be if I thought every every squeak of the floorboard, every movement of the wind, every um, ill ill thing that came into my life, or every perhaps joyous thing that came in my life? Where would I be if I thought that it was just a random happenstance? If you know what? If it's just karma? You know, a lot of people say, "Well, I'm not karma," or you know, um, just just anything other than the hand of God, I'd, I'd be a mess. I mean, I'm a mess already at times. But apart from God, I'd be an incredible mess. And as we continue our study, Abraham believed God, we learned the last few weeks of Abraham's life with God, his experience with God, and uh, his faith in God. And this week, Paul is going to take us through um, the fact that David celebrates the same truth as Abraham did. That his righteousness was not based upon works, but upon faith in God. And that's huge. That's huge, especially as we walk closer to eternity. You know, for some of us, years and years and years, perhaps. Others... Perhaps a few moments. We don't know what God has in store. But in that, to take and glean from our forebears, to glean from what Paul is bringing forward to uh, the Jews, what he's bringing forward to those within the church in the day, is huge. Because guess what? Everything's changed except what? God. Everything has changed. We don't have the same transportation. We don't have the same clothes. We don't have the same manner of speaking. We don't have the same governments. Everything has changed, like continuous lifting of the blanket and everything falls, flies in the air and falls off the sun. But God remains. The things that he has brought forward is truth. And uh, let's read verses 5 through 8. Romans 4 this morning. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. David penned verses 7 through 8. Paul brought them forward and incorporated them in Romans. And they're from Psalm 32, verses 1 through 2. I'm going to read those. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. David was a guy who was what? Scripture tells us. A man after God's own heart. Correct? But how many bumps and bruises, warts and wiggles, did David have? He had plenty. He had plenty of great decisions that could take and um, uh, I guess uh, please God or did please God. But he made plenty of bad decisions and as he turned his face against God. But he could pen this much as he could pen the 139th Psalm, much as he could pen the 23rd Psalm, much as he could pen much of the Psalms because of the heart that that he had. And he had a heart that understood forgiveness. He had a heart that understood the Lord. He had a heart that understood that in spite of him, God was and God is, and God will be forevermore. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Read now Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. We're going to be told that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. 
Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would uh, eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. See, the simplicity of faith is it's a gift from God, right? It, it is an absolute gift from God that no man may boast. So if God is into giving gifts or a gift such as faith to man, why is there such a problem with receiving it? Why is there such an issue with a man receiving the grace of God through faith in God, why is that such a problem? Because we have been conditioned that there's no free lunches, right? There's no free chickens. I mean, if, if an advertisement were to come on TV, everyone who looks upon this advertisement, within the next 20 years, if you phone this number, you will get absolutely a free mansion you will get a free car, and you will get a lifetime full of ducats to pay for all of that. Now, how many of us are going to phone that number, right? That is so good to be true that, that we wouldn't phone that number. We're looking for the small print. We're looking, I mean, you know, I'm on the internet, and I see these otherworldly offers. That's like, you got to be kidding me. I'm not even going to click on that puppy. Because you know that that there's a cost. And you know, the only cost that that's involved with this gift of faith, it costs the Father. He gave his son, it costs the son, he gave his life. It costs the Holy Spirit, he gets to hang out in this pile of stuff now. But David, David understood the blessedness of those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, who, who isn't imputed to sin. God breathing upon the dead the breath of life. And they came to life, reading out of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. For by nature we were children of wrath, just as the others. How awesome is it that you are no longer a child of wrath, just as the others? How awesome is it that you are now a child of God? How awesome is the fact that your eternity, your future is secure? How awesome is that? And, and as Paul continues to take and wrap his arms around those in Rome, as he continues to bring forward truths by which he desires them to understand and come to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, he, he is going to continue. He's not going to become weary. He's not going to be that, that prophet, that, that apostle, that Christian, that Christ lover, who's just going to take and go, oh, I'm done with you. I, I've said it before and before. No, I'm going to say it again. I don't know where I left off here in Ephesians, but I'll jump in at uh, verse 4. 
But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made alive to, us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As Christians, should there be good works that pour out of us? I think so. I think there should be good works that pour out of us. And as those good works pour out of us, who do they point to? They point back to the Lord, right? And they pour out of us not because we're working our way to heaven, but because the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us, and something's been poured out upon us, and something should pour out from within us. You know, I won't, uh, I won't mention any names, Tony. Um, so I didn't do that. I love Tony. Tony is like all of us. He puts his trousers on one leg at a time. Unless there's something I should know about Tony. I think one leg at a time. But we've known each other for, for many, many years. And it's by the grace of God that I've been able to see the humility of my brother. Went to high school, all stuff through, throughout our lives after high school. Tony, I got to watch as the Lord allowed him to be in some pretty interesting situations. In my descriptive, I don't know how he would describe that. But you know, when somebody has their focus upon the Lord, it seems like the only one who realizes the interesting situations that somebody gets put into for those that are watching from afar. As I got to watch Tony, uh, he ministered to me. As I got to watch uh, the life he lived, uh, he spoke volumes. And, you know, the only one, um, and, I'm, and I'm just saying this, and maybe I'm rambling, and it, forgive me if I'm putting you in an awkward position, but really never had anybody come down and clean the church. Right? I mean, he a couple days a week. I mean, how many... You know, copper roaches and, you know, um, centipedes. And, I mean, I usually catch them when I come in. Or I can see them and get them out of Dodge, you know. But, but Tony's just, like, coming down and cleaning the church. And you brought your grandson? You brought your grandson? And your wife? No way. So it was a family outing? Yeah. No, and he didn't even ask. But, but I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to make is for Tony... That's his beloved service to our Lord. That's what it is. And it's like, how many books have you written, Tony? How many seminars have you spoke at, Tony? How many, you know, it doesn't matter. And, and as we read about the faith that Abraham had in our Lord, God said, go and he went. David speaking of that righteousness apart from works. And it's incredible when a man or a woman or a child is so anointed and possessed by the Holy Spirit that they just go forward and they just do. And they do to the glory of God. And it's not working to justify their salvation. It's not working to accumulate self-righteousness. What it is, it's their due diligence to serve their beloved God who before the foundation of the world loved them and they didn't know him, and gave them that gift of faith. Verses 9 and 10 does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? 
How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while well circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Abraham believed God, and Abraham's belief, his faith in God, was accounted to him for righteousness. We talked about this uh, last week, Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6. Uh, God, 14 years prior to Abraham being circumcised, uh, Abram placed his faith in the Lord. 14 years prior to circumcision. Read out of uh, Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing as I go childless in the air of my house as Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you were able to number them. And he said to him, God saying to Abram, So shall your descendants be. Verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. Fourteen years prior to circumcision. Ever look at the stars in the sky? Ever look at the sands in the sea? And you ever think to yourself, Dang, what, what kind of God do I serve? He knows the number. He knows everything. He put it all in place. And it's just so incredible. And it's not by works. It's by faith that we have Christ's righteousness. Read out of Genesis 17, verses 1 through 11, 14 years after Genesis 15, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you were a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abram and him, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and me. By faith he believed. Fourteen years later he was given a sign. And by faith we believe. Nothing's changed. Uh, verses 11 and 12. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had while still circumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believed. Though they are circum uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Circumcised, uncircumcised, it's faith that we need to pay attention to. Reading out of Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, Zacchaeus did not buy his way into salvation or work his way toward salvation. Zacchaeus' changed life testifies, testified to a righteousness that was not due to works, but was apart from works. So Luke 19, 1 through 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. 
And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead, climbed up in the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, in case come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, uh, look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. See, what had happened there in that transi- transaction was Zacchaeus had a totally changed and transformed life. He boomed. He did not only a 170, not only a 360, he did a 720. He had a totally transformed life. And as we continue our study, excuse you, as we continue our study next week and the worship team comes up, I want to encourage everybody not only to read ahead, but to really continue to ask yourself the question, what has God set before me? And if he has set something before me and I'm not reaching out and and grabbing onto it or uh, doing what he would have me to do, why not? Why not? We all have those things that if we would see those things through the eye of faith, we would trust God and we'd act upon them. Yet, somehow we think that, well, I'm not a very gifted singer, so I'm not going to see if the worship team needs me. Well, I'm not a very gifted teacher, so I'm probably not going to see if Sunday school could use me. You know, I don't know how to pray, so why pray at all? I mean, just so many things that God has blessed us with, yet we sit on a shelf because we, we don't want to exercise faith. 